this hill to climb is the one within. Who is Stephen Hill? I'm someone that takes things to the extreme. I get a hold of something and I go all the way with it. That has shown me some really positive results in my life. It's how I got to where I am today, but it's also how I ended up addicted for over a decade. I think every American over the age of 12 must be conscious of the word narcotics. I think it's a scare word, as it should be. We know what heroin, morphine, and cocaine can do to the human body and the human personality. People who are hooked on these drugs are seldom hooked in the dark. But there's a strong possibility that at this moment in your medicine cabinet, you have a drug that can hook you just as completely, injure you just as terribly as heroin or morphine. speaking at Suffer Middle School the most is because it started exactly where you were sitting right now. When I was in eighth grade here at Suffer Middle School, I made the junior varsity lacrosse team. I was a middle school student playing a high school sport. So at the end of the day, I, I'm getting bussed over to the high school and I'm practicing with freshmen, sophomores, even a few juniors. And I heard a lot of them talking about drinking, about smoking, going to parties. I was curious. Now, I didn't use anything when I was in middle school, but as soon as I got into high school, that would change. I just thought to myself, this just must be the way things go in high school. I'll drink and smoke a little bit on the weekends. I'll still do well in school. I'll play sports, I'll graduate, and then I'll go off to college. That night, I had met a girl who was a senior, and she had dated one of my older friends. And a few weeks later, that same girl came into our school the morning of our pep rally. So these three girls, are, they're drinking all morning throughout the pep rally, which ended just before lunchtime. They get in the convertible, they pull out, they're all drunk, they're going down the road, lose control of it, it flipped over, landed on that one girl, and she was killed. 
And I do remember very well what it was like that next day in Suffern High School. The hallways were just completely silent, and if it wasn't silence, it was just people crying. I don't bring up this story in a way to try and scare people. I bring up this story to remind you that you do not have to be addicted to drugs and alcohol for bad things to happen. This girl did not have a major problem with drugs or alcohol. She was your average student athlete, made one bad choice, and lost her life because of it. So I first started using simply because I was peer pressured, I thought it was cool, I wanted to fit in, all those reasons. It was actually kind of like a rite of passage where as much as sports was a positive outlet for me, it was also a negative one. It's where I was introduced to everything. I was introduced to drugs and alcohol, it's where I went to these parties. And so I started doing it just because I thought it was part of a normal high school experience. But I would draw all these lines. I would say, I'm gonna try and control my use. I need to do a better job of not using during the week or trying not to get caught. And the biggest mistake that I made is I underestimated the power of drugs and alcohol. I thought I can control my use. Turns out, I could not. Drugs and alcohol controlled me. For the past six, this is going into the seventh school year of me doing this officially. I've been going around to middle schools, high schools, colleges. If I was to overdose and die, the height of my addiction, right, when I was 24 years old. Yes, it would be tragic, but would it be a shock to, to anyone? I, I don't think it would be. But when a kid goes on Snapchat and buys fentanyl off the dark web or something like that, and it comes and he just thinks it's a pill, he has no history of drug use, takes one pill and dies, that's different. You know, kids are curious. People have talked about experimental phases and one message you're going to hear tonight is, is that phase is gone. A single pound of opium bought in Bombay and broken down for sale to drug addicts. Traffic in drugs and the use of drugs is fostered by no one race. Drugs affect all races and all classes of people. I mean, every situation is a little bit different, but one thing about addiction is that it does really affect all different walks of life, and the numbers keep getting worse. And this is why we say that addiction is a family disease, because it affects a lot more than just the person who's actually using the drugs. Where when he was younger, it was like, you know, um, he used to have a hard time getting up in the morning and like it was terrible but on Wednesday mornings when he had like um, Wednesday morning lacrosse you know like there was just no stopping him right because it was something that I really loved to do that I was so interested in I would sit there and I would throw the ball against the wall and I would do whatever I had to do to get better and I could see like once 10th grade came around his attitude changed As an educator and parent I was a little startled by the lack of urgency in his mother's response. It was something like, well, you know, he's going through a lot of difficulties now. You know, but I didn't, I didn't really think at that time, you know, it was like a problem problem because, you know, I just thought, you know, well, kids experiment, or not all, but most do. For Mark to call and tell them your son's high, it certainly wasn't a shock to them. They probably heard it from 20 other people. And so him calling and saying that I was high just, was pretty much stating the obvious. So I don't think that really had any impact on anything other than Mark's perception of me and, and his perception of my family. He had openly admitted that at that time he had kind of judged them based on their response. But until you know what it's like to live with a kid suffering from substance use disorder, you just, you can't judge. And I was judging her as someone, does this person really care? There was no way to know that uh, what Stephen's parents had been through, how serious the situation really was. So uh, I, I really didn't like her answer uh, as an educator and somebody who was reporting this, but I had no idea of the backstory and I had no right to make that judgment. And, and generally school, I was not interested in. And that's why I struggled so much in school. That's why I struggled in things that don't pique my interest. School never worked out. Um, then it was trying different rehabs, you know, a number of them over and over. Um, and plus I had a brother-in-law who was in recovery who tried to help him, another friend. Like we just had like, it was just, it was huge trying. You know, it wasn't like somebody, it wasn't like somebody sitting in the corner and nobody was paying attention. Come back. You know, the BWF, all I have to say is, have a good time.
stay clean, don't get drunk, and TWL sucks! The use of any lasers, cameras, or videos, except for that dude, is strictly prohibited. Also, the use of any alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, crack, cocaine, Damn heroin, oh, or oh, ecstasy oh, oh. is prohibited. Ejection from the arena. Oh, oh. I could always see like we still had that relationship, but there was just like a distance that I couldn't connect with him. He was kind of in his own world in a lot of ways. Dealing with a brother, family member, you know, a friend who's, who's dealing with addiction can be you know, extremely difficult, uh, confusing and, and frustrating. But as I got a little bit older, I think once I started figuring out the path Steve was going down, I I think I definitely judged a lot, you know, what, what, why can't he be better, um, you know, he, he continues to go down the same path. I was like, I remember having the dynamic saying, am I the only dad in America who came home from work, had a catch with, baseball catch with two of his sons and I, somehow that's a problem, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, because I wasn't dealing with Steven's problem. You have no idea. There are some parents I know who try everything they possibly can to help their kid, and yet their kid is still out there struggling every single day. But, you know, at the end of the day, while it is really them who needs to make the choice to help themselves, when they make that choice, they need family, they need friends, they need support. So tonight I'm going to share my story about my personal struggles with substance use and journey to recovery. And even more so this year, I'm getting asked to speak at special events like this one with Washington Goes Purple. The police department and our fire department have been all in on our initiatives. Like with Washington Goes Purple, of course, that's for education and, and to try to prevent addiction in, in children and things like that. We've got to move past reacting and we got to move towards prevention and being progressively proactive in doing so. And that is a culture change because those of us that have never used, that are not addicted, can't truly understand the impact of how do you stop that from happening because they've never experienced it. So for us, you know, we're on the response end. We're going, the police, the fire department, EMS, we're going there, we're, we're responding to the issue after the fact. Uh, really what we need is proactive action. So again, why we're wearing the purple shirts, um, promoting the, the awareness of, hey, this is how people become um, addicted. You know, the big push for Washington Goes Purple is educating the youth on what it started out as, how prescription drug can lead to opioid addiction. You know, one of the things that we do with Washington Goes Purple is, and, and this is sort of the preventive side. This is really a prevention to talk to the kids about the dangers of prescription pain medication that people didn't understand that a prescription pain medication is heroin. Basically it's synthetic heroin. And we weren't having these conversations with our children and what we're seeing now is kids are using um, illicit pills. Kids, kids in the household, not overdose, but kids that are in that environment. That's that's because they, they don't have any control over it. You know, it's it's their caretakers, their parents, whomever, um, and, and the toll that that has on them, and they don't even realize it. With finding a way to stop that six-year-old, my six-year-old, from wanting to to try something and go down that path. We don't, we don't train and work on parents to know that when that kid, that 17 year old who's playing sports gets hurt and has to be put on an, an opioid related prescription drug to monitor and make sure that they don't get, get hooked on that, we are not gonna stop this. I think people just need to be kind and realize that this can happen to you. 
can happen to me. I have a 14 year old daughter and she knows more about drugs than probably most adults because I've open and honest conversations with her. I would like to think my daughter's not going to use drugs because she was there when my best friend died from a heroin overdose and knows how devastated I was. I also live in the real world <laughs> and understand that there's a possibility she could use drugs. The way the drugs are coming in our community is that we, we're not too far from Baltimore City and Baltimore has always been known as the heroin capital of, of the United States for many years but it was a different kind of heroin back then, black tar heroin and, and then when prescription opioids really became prominent um, that's when we started seeing a change. These drugs, which I repeat, are our best, strongest pain medications, should be used much more than they are for patients in pain. But it was first falsely marketed as non-addictive. You had these pharmaceutical companies like Purdue Pharma, the Sackler family, uh, making millions and billions of dollars off of this stuff. And during this time is when heroin made a big comeback. Today, the city became the latest in a growing list of 200 communities nationwide hoping to make pharmaceutical companies pay for the opioid crisis that kills more than 100 people every day. We use the tragedy of an overdose, uh, an overdose death, as an opportunity. That opportunity to see where we can backtrack how this person got the heroin, where that drug trade started, so we can go after that distribution point and not the user to user kind of way. Fentanyl has become so much more prevalent, so it changed the landscape of what's going on today. And that's the, those two things together, now more just strictly fentanyl, is the reason why you're seeing the overdose numbers keep going up and up and up. As a, the primary first responder, we're all medically trained as EMTs. So when there's uh, an overdose um, incident, um, so we can get there and provide uh, all the life-saving treatments that they need, including Narcan administration, um, to, to bring them out of that overdose, prevent them from um, respiratory arrest or cardiac arrest. Can you hear me? Hey, buddy, with All right, can you hear me? Oh, good. even just health challenges in general. Um, we've had situations where someone wants to go to a rehab center but they have open abscess on their arms from using, well, you have to treat the person's medical issues before they can even consider getting themselves sober. The biggest impact we got here and, and where, where we're at right now is that there's a lack of resources. There's a lack of those places that we can get them into. When you can't get the money to buy the pills or you can't get the pills anymore because they can't get them prescribed to you and you can't steal enough of them for somebody else, you gotta, you gotta get to that, that feeling you need to, to take care of. As an addict, you're gonna go to heroin. And now that heroin could be done in powder form and snorted and you didn't have to inject because most everybody that I've ever met that's recovering and has been recovering, everyone to a T said they would never, never use a needle, never inject themselves. And the ones in recent history that could use the higher potency heroin that's now around compared to what it was 20 years ago. When we look at the opioid crisis, I think everybody's been hit hard. And what we're finding out with other layers is that the obstacles aren't just the treatment obstacles. They're the housing, it's the food, it's the transportation, it's the medical needs, it's the undiagnosed or untreated mental health. Um, issues or diagnosis that they may have. When we started this whole Washington Goes Purple thing, I said, why don't we do a walking take back? She said, what do we mean? I said, let's go door to door. Let's take the health department, let's take fire department, let's take law enforcement and take community members and let's go door to door and let's pick a community. Let's pick a small area. Let's go door to door, knock on the door and ask, do you have any medications, unwanted medications you'd like to get rid of? We're here to do that. And it wasn't so much just to get the drugs, it was a way to start to have an engagement. For us, it's about bringing more resources. And we have a great health department here that has a robust harm reduction program, which is great. It's very controversial. It was very controversial, especially here in Washington County, you know, giving out uh, clean syringes and, and things like that. Um, but it works. We know it works. And our job as human beings is to keep people alive until they're ready to get help. Kevin Simmers runs Brooks House, a center for women in recovery in Hagerstown. He has been a partner in Mayor Keller's crusade. She's been at the forefront in the uh, fight on addiction and 
the fight against opioids for uh, her entire tenure in office. Simmer says Keller knows the strengths and weaknesses of the current efforts to attack the addiction crisis. She's all too aware of the lack of services available, the lack of treatment available. So she will be a voice for definitely the people that are not spoken for, and she'll be a voice for people that are suffering from this. As far as individuals come into Brooks House, it's very diverse. Now this is a women's level of care, so we're seeing women from 18, 19 years old to late 50s or 60s struggling with many different substances, primarily opioid uh, substance use disorder, but alcohol, um, benzodiazepines, amphetamine or cocaine. We're also seeing a lot of women that are coming in here with significant issues of trauma, mental health, daily life skills. Maybe some of our women are coming from backgrounds where their parents were alcoholic or addict. I can't blame my using on anybody but myself. Um, it's something within me. I wanted to feel included. I wanted to fit in. Um, and for me, fitting in was using drugs and alcohol at a very young age. And when I, when I began to use heroin, I kept it undercover for a very long time. Heroin became the love of my life. It was number one. Nothing else could change that. I put heroin before my children. I put heroin before my family. I put heroin before myself. I'm Jason Marin. I'm a person in long-term recovery. Uh, means I haven't picked up a drug or had a drink since January 8th, 2019. You know, I, I just want to be an advocate and, and be a voice for the people that's still sick and suffering because I was there at one time. It's a progressive disease that it might start out small, but it's progressive and it'll take you down a dark path and destruction. It destroys everything in its path. I think I speak for more than just myself, right? There are plenty of people who have the same story that I do, right? Not exactly the same, but are just either not willing to share it. A big part of that is gonna be because of stigma, which is one of the main reasons I, I do this, is to fight that stigma. So what makes our stories, I would say, and that's for everybody in recovery, impactful is that we were able to come out on the other side of this. Agents know the cocaine was shipped to Philadelphia, then trucked to New York. Tons came through South Florida. Drugs pouring into the country. There is more cocaine available today than almost any time in our history. Tonight's special segment looks at the invasion of drugs across the border. And the United States has used very few resources to fight back. Drugs take away the dream from every child's heart and replace it with a nightmare. Nancy has been intensely involved in the effort to fight drug abuse. Not long ago, I was asked by a group of children what to do if they were offered drugs. And I answered, just say no. No, 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 no. Chapter one, wine dance long. Allen, 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 Allen. Okay. Look, look. And I came into addiction because I didn't want to be who I was. I grew up in the era of don't ask, don't tell. So there were things going on in my house that I knew wasn't right, but uh, I, nobody never asked me the questions, so I had no avenue to tell anybody what was going on. After I came, came back from the war, I started smoking crack and uh, 
I, 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 I truly fell in love with that drug. You know, and smoke, smoking crack led me to places I didn't want to be, to do things I didn't want to do, just to get the next one. Definitely a history of uh, alcoholism. You know, my mom would be uh, intoxicated uh, several times. I had a lot of dark moments. I had si suicidal ideation on January 7, 2019. I wrote a three-page letter to my wife. I downed a bottle of narcotics and I got down on my knees. Whether I believed in a God at that time or not, I was in tears, I looked up at the ceiling and I, I asked God, I said, please forgive me for what I'm about ready to do. Shortly after that, I got a text message from my daughter saying she had gallbladder pain. I ended up calling her and that's what, that text message saved my life. In recent years, there has been a shocking increase in drug addiction among young people, often in their teens, who take up the habit without the slightest understanding of the living nightmare they are so unthinkingly walking into. My first experience with alcohol and drugs happened the same night. First beer was when I was seven years old. I remember not tasting very good, but I liked the feeling. My mother told me the story that the first time I ever got drunk, I was a toddler. With alcohol, I was at a party and I started drinking and I was able to open up and talk. And then it went to marijuana, uh, then it went to other substances. And for me, fitting in was using drugs and alcohol at a very young age. I started smoking weed and using alcohol at 14. I was invited to a party and there were like a whole bunch of people there. I mean, I saw half the school was there and there were some kegs in the corner. I, I could see these, this, you know, orange light going up and down all over the place. And it's basically just cigarettes being smoked, some blunts being smoked. And, and so I saw one of my older friends there. It was a teammate of mine on hockey and lacrosse. And, and he called me over and, and he poured me my first beer. And uh, my family used to have parties that lasted the weekend. So we party hard. So at least twice a month, we would have parties that last the weekend. And everybody was asleep because they were drunk. And I was, as a little kid, walking around empty in everybody's glass that was left on the table. And I smoked my first cigarette. I had a few beers that night and I went home that night and we walked to my friend's house. I slept there. The next morning, we're all excited. We're talking about it. We went to our first party and little did I know that that was the start to a decade long nightmare. Every day I woke up, I wanted to make sure that I knew exactly where that next drink or drug was coming from. I put my family and my friends in danger because I was so addicted and so committed to this drug, especially opioids, Oxycontin and heroin. To me, I've learned over the years there, hasn't, there isn't a big difference between addiction and commitment, right? You're, you're committed to something and I've been committed to becoming a speaker, I've been committed to going back to school, becoming a lawyer, I've been committed to being a better person, a friend, a father, or a husband. But when I was addicted, I was committed. Since the last meeting, they have been busy raising enough cash for the next dose. Theft, directly attributable to drug addiction, causes a staggering annual loss to legitimate business. For no job will pay for the drugs an addict must have every few hours. Many believe that addiction should be made a crime, that the addict should not be permitted to destroy himself and infect his community, that fear of punishment is a deterrent to crime and would reduce the number of addicts. Others say the use of drugs is an expression of weakness that in itself would never be considered criminal, that addiction is an illness and treatment in proper institutions is the only solution. Whatever the answer, one thing is certain, addiction and crime go hand in hand. I, I've lived outside. I wore the same clothes for two months, not taking a shower because I might miss the next one. You know, and um, getting the next one was the most important thing to me. Like, 
I, I, I became unemployed because I, I thought that going to work for eight hours to get a check on Friday that was going to get smoked up on Friday night and I wasn't going to be able to go to work on Saturday anyway was a waste of time. If I stayed in the red zone, I could get high all day, every day. And that was the kind of twisted thinking that I had when I was using. I wore the same clothes for two months, so I rain, sleet, snow, hail like the rain, like the mailman. My, you know, it, I was out there. So I, I had this piece in between my fingers. I see the cops, and they're turning on to the main street, and we make eye contact. I, I'm saying to myself, yo, I gotta get rid of this so that when they search me, they don't find it, and I can come back and get it. He pulled up on me, and I'm still trying to get this out. And then I fling my arms. I'm like, what do you want, officer? And I do like this. And the piece goes up in the air. And it's like slow motion. And then it lands right between his feet. And he looks down and he's like, When the last time you used? Did you give me some symptoms right now to make me think you used some time of day? Turn your ass around. And I'm like, wow. So in Christmas of, right before Christmas of 2005, I was with three of my friends and we left my house to go drop off marijuana at somebody else's house and then we had two blunts rolled that we were gonna smoke on the way back. As soon as we pulled off the street, there was a marked police car right across the street waiting for us to pull out. As soon as we pulled out, the marked police car came behind us. Eventually they pulled us over and there were two blunts that I had in my hand and, and I, I remember I put them out and I ate them. And then all of a sudden these two unmarked cars with their lights on start coming up the street and kind of block us in. And now I knew, okay, this is not a random pullover. They got us out of the car, they searched us and we didn't have anything on us because I, I had eaten both of the blunts. It's all right, boss. Open your mouth. You swallowed it? and then the canine unit came, the dog was searching. They had to let us go because nobody admitted to anything and they couldn't find anything, but it was clear they were on me. I was pulled over again. I had four bags of marijuana on me. I was trying to eat them, so I wasn't pulling over right away. And the guy just like ran out of his car, ripped me out of the car, threw me to the ground, handcuffed me, and, and that was the first time I got arrested. It is the control personnel who see at closest hand the hopeless round. The same men and women going in and out of jails year after year who make the strongest plea for some further method of dealing with addiction other than jails alone. In the growing mass of research data, people are beginning to see why a man turns to drugs. That it stems from a basic weakness in his personality. A weakness that in many cases can be corrected that he is a man who, with the aid of mental and physical treatment, can be rehabilitated in society and enabled to face life without reliance on drugs. I was arrested eight times, and in one way or another, they were all related to drugs and alcohol. And it got progressively worse, right? You start with unlawful possession of marijuana, criminal possession of marijuana, criminal possession of a controlled substance, criminal possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute, right? Money laundering, y you name it, I was charged with it. And just like my addiction, my criminal charges got progressively worse. Throughout the next six or seven years, I made a lot of bad choices. When I was 19, I called out of work one day, got on the back of a four-wheeler with somebody I just should not have been in the back of a four-wheeler with. We were under the influence, we're driving to the woods, we get to the bottom of this cliff. You go up and you go to the right, you go down nice and easy. As you go to the left, the cliff just drops off. My friend in the single, he goes to the right, goes down nice and easy. Me and my other friend, we went to the left. We were going full speed, by the time we got to the top of this cliff, it was too late. We went flying off and I compound fractured my right femur bone, which means my thigh bone was cracked in half and sticking out of my body. Call my drug dealer. I said to him, I really need some painkillers. The doctor won't give me anymore. He wasn't going to have anything for a few days. So I had been misusing and abusing these pills for months. And all of a sudden, one day, I just stopped. 
It was around 24, 36 hours went by. I'm sitting there in the wheelchair next to my friend and I said to him, I don't know, man, I'm, I'm starting to feel sick. I feel like I have the flu or something. He looks at me and he shakes his head and he says, you don't have the flu, you're dope sick. Without the white powder too long, his whole body revolted in dreadful protest. Sweat poured from him. He got the shakes. He had cold chills. His nose ran and his eyes ran. I said, dope sick, what does that even mean? He says, you're physically addicted to opioids and because you stopped using, your body's going through withdrawals. But check this. I know a guy, I'll go on the street, I'll buy this pill Oxycontin, I'll bring it back, I'll break it up, you'll snort it, and that sick feeling will go away almost instantly. I gave him some money, he went in the street, he bought me this pill Oxycontin, he brought it back, he broke it up, he said snort it, I did it. And that sick feeling was gone almost instantly. And that was the first time I realized I was physically addicted to opioids and drugs like that will take you down very, very quickly. One of the first things I experienced where I, I really knew how serious this was, I ran out of Oxycontin and I couldn't find anything. And so I had a friend of mine who was selling marijuana for me. And I told him, I asked him, you know, do you have any Oxy? He said, no, I, I, I can't find that right now. But if you want, I can get you heroin. And I was like, heroin? Like, who does that? Like, he's like, no, nah, man, it's, it's, it's not what it sounds like. He's like. It's basically the same thing as these painkillers you're taking. It's just, it's much cheaper and we can get it 24 seven. And I'm like, all right, let's do it. And so we're driving, we're driving down to Patterson and he tells me to, I never forget, he says, make a right of the third light of fright. And I'm like, all right, wh whatever that means. And, and, and I make a right and we go over these train tracks and I stop at the first stop sign and these people start coming over to my car. And he's like, keep going, keep going. And I'm like, why, what's going on? He's like, this is an open air drug market. I'm still kind of naive, I'm 19 years old. I'm like, well, what is an open air drug market? He's like, every single corner down here, you can buy heroin on. Go down Governor Street and we're gonna go meet this guy. And he gets in the back of the car and as soon as he gets in, I can see he has a gun in his pants. And right away, I'm like completely thrown off by this. I'd never seen anything like this before. And he asked us what we want and, and we told him how many and he gets out and he takes her money and some little kid comes out and gives us our heroin. And then we ended up driving the guy back up the block a little bit. He, he ran out and disappeared. And that was my first heroin buy. It's progressive. At the height of my addiction, I had a 900 milligram a day habit. On the street, he was going for as much as a dollar a milligram. That's $900 a day. How does somebody afford a drug habit like that? Well, that's why I got involved in dealing drugs, illegal gambling, things I think about today I cannot even believe I was involved in. But when your brain is addicted, when your body is addicted, you don't think about the consequences. You don't think about how your actions are hurting other people. And this is also the reason why so many people turn to heroin, because it's cheaper and it's readily available, except today it's laced with a very powerful substance called fentanyl. 911, what do you need, please, fire medical? So I have what? three people that are, apparently they seem to be passed out drunk, not waking up in my parking lot. Like, two of them are on the ground. 11.30 on a Saturday night. Deputies are called to help two men and a woman, all unresponsive. Now the deputies have custody of this pickup. They have to determine what caused all this. In reality, the drugs the trio were taking here that night were laced with fentanyl a synthetic opioid that drug dealers use to make their drug supply last longer and more profitable. Drug cartels are now pressing their own pills. People think they're buying one thing on the street. It turns out to be this powerful substance called fentanyl. And this is the reason why people are overdosing and dying at such an alarming rate. It is truly the most dangerous time in history to be using any substance because fentanyl is being found in everything. My mom sat me down. My dad was standing behind her and my mom said to me, you need to leave our house today, right now. Until you are ready to go away and get long-term help, do not call us, do not call anybody in this family, leave today, goodbye. 
Growing up when I was a kid, I had this friend and we were told by our parents to never get in the car with his father. When we were little kids, we didn't know why, but as we got older, we found out he was addicted to crack cocaine. He found out where I lived, knew I had drugs and money in my home, got my own place in Mawa, New Jersey, and the wrong people found out that I had drugs and money in my home. And they came there, one guy had a knife, the other one had a bat, they had duct tape and rope, and their plan was to break into my apartment, steal my drugs and my money if they couldn't find it, wait for me to get home, beat me, tie me up, and make me tell them where it is. I was very lucky I wasn't home that night. They broke my back window trying to break in. My neighbor heard it, she called 911. Police got there very quickly and caught them. But it also gave the police what's called exigent circumstances, which means they can go inside my apartment and make sure nobody's hurt. Now they're supposed to just go in there and search for bodies to make sure nobody's hurt, but they used the opportunity to search and they found all my drugs and all my money. And I think they found, I think it was around 850 uh, 30 milligram oxycodone tablets. They found about 35,000 in cash. They found currency and counting machines, scales, baggies, and now I'm being charged at the felony level. What was the lowest moment in your addiction? And for me, it was being on felony probation in New Jersey, staying at my parents' house here in Suffern. I see cop cars on every corner, like, you know, I'm like, that's weird, you know? So I called up Steven right away. I said, Steve, there's cop cars on the corners. Like, is there any reason that there should be cop cars? Like, is you th are they for here for you? Just sitting there with my grandmother when all of a sudden the police kick in the door and arrest me again on more felony drug charges. You know, they searched my whole house and, you know, they took them away in a cop car. Handcuffed me, walked me out in front of all the neighbors. And the craziest part about that day for me was that I didn't even really care. I didn't care. I was so broken and lost at that point. I had pretty much accepted my fate as prison and eventually death. You'd think that I'm used to this because I've heard him speak before and, and I lived it. But every time he speaks, I get emotional and, and I even get triggered. I remember speaking to the lieutenant outside and, um, you know, just, and he was like, this is a good thing. And he said, it's a good thing because now, now maybe he'll get the help and accept the help that he needs. But this was three weeks before my older brother's wedding. It was supposed to be a really happy time for my family and here I am again, just messing it up for everyone. You know, so to have to explain that to everybody would have been just a nightmare. Judge, he's a good boy. I understand. And we worked it out with his lawyer and he was able to get out for that one day and then go back in the next day. So I would say that was the darkest moment, but then it turned it out, turned around to be probably the best thing that ever happened. I got bailed out of jail to make it to my brother's wedding on September 28, 2012. So when they took me to the precinct and everything, you know, the next day I go to court and I go in front of the judge. What do you have to say for yourself? I said, well, Your Honor, I'm an addict. If you give me a date to come back to court, cause I got a daughter, you know, and I want her to see me while I messed up. And then I come back and we're going to rehab and then we'll be, you know, she can see the before and the after. He said, you know what? He said, you sound pretty eloquent. He said, you'll make a good lawyer when you get out. Bail $20,000. Bang the gavel. I started like flipping out. I'm like, twenty thousand dollars? That's ransom. That ain't a bail. That's that's ransom. I don't got no money. I'm homeless. Da 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 da. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. It is epidemic and it can kill. We must be intolerant of drug use and drug sellers. The crack problem has become a crack crisis and it's spreading nationwide. We must be intolerant of drugs, not because we want to punish drug users but because we care about them and want to help them. Meanwhile, in another part of the world, the United States was funding an illegal war in Nicaragua, and drug smugglers were sending cocaine to the U.S. on U.S. planes. Somehow, the United States officials had no clue. We deal in too many externals, brother. Hopefully every night, police pick up bodies. We deal in too many externals, brother. Externals, brother. Too many. Ex
externals, brother. We deal in too many externals. There were disproportionate sentences for crack cocaine versus powdered cocaine and how people who were caught with crack cocaine were getting significantly more harsh sentences than people with powdered cocaine. And crack cocaine which was much cheaper uh, to buy, to purchase. It was much more prevalent in low-income communities with people of color. And so that whole policy disproportionately affected people of color. Before we were throwing everyone in jail and thinking that that solved a problem. And we did it all wrong. Didn't solve anything. Just put a bunch of people in jail. They didn't need jail, they needed help. The underlying issue is we've chosen prison as a way to respond to that problem of crime. And there are a whole variety of ways that we could have chosen to respond to that problem of crime. We've chosen the response of the deprivation of liberty. And we've chosen the response of the deprivation of liberty for a historically aggrieved group whose liberty in the United States was never firmly established to begin with. I think that the biggest difference between the opioid epidemic and something like the crack epidemic is that really important people, who they believe to be really important, uh, their kids started dying. And a lot of times they were white kids. It's always been a problem, but as long as it was contained to the black community, it was cool. But once it started to enter white America and the rich people's kids, then now it's a problem. It did, before we started treating this for what it is, a public health crisis. And I think if heroin, if opioids, if prescription painkillers, if this epidemic has taught us anything, is that anyone can have a substance use disorder. This is not a black or white thing, it's not a rich or poor thing. It doesn't matter if your parents are married, it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter what side of the street you live on. Drug addiction looks like me, it looks like you, it looks like any, any of us. I know how lucky I am that I was able to make it through, that I made it out the other side. And there is luck involved in it. You can take it a step further and say that I was privileged in several different ways and where I had the resources to, to get help. I ended up in the criminal justice system for some of my charges where it could have very easily gone the other direction. I ended up in state prison, but I didn't. And I am aware that I was privileged in those situations, and I'm, I'm not saying that I didn't go through a, a ton of pain and, and misery and suffering, and I, I destroyed my family for like a decade. I mean, it just, there's no other way of saying it, but at the same time, I do understand that I was given opportunities to heal that I should have been given but that other people are not given. A lot of the administration wants to make it not, they say they want to make it nonpartisan, but are they really making it nonpartisan when they're uh, criticizing the other administration's actions to try to find a solution? Instead of humbling themselves and coming together and collaborate something together to find a solution, the cartels in Mexico have evolved quickly from drug cartels to transnational criminals to now terrorists like we've never seen ever. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Hezbollah, they're not killing this amount of Americans. While it is true that a great deal of fentanyl comes into the United States from Mexico, it is overwhelmingly U.S. citizens, not migrants, who are bringing it in. But Aaron Rockwell had a message for both sides. United we stand, divided we fall. United we stand. Divided, we fall. Uh, I don't want to sound cliche and say that we just need to talk to each other because that's what everyone says. We just need to have a conversation because we can talk all day long. I mean, if we're not hearing each other, it doesn't really matter. But I also need to try to understand you, your experiences, where you got to, to where you are today. What caused, what, what led you to where you are? So right now, the, the biggest, the major problem with the drug epidemic is fentanyl, for sure, 100%. Right now, drug overdose deaths are at an all-time high. 
The latest numbers I got was the CDC reported over 109,000 drug overdose deaths in the 12 month period ending in March, 2022, which is the highest number ever recorded. I mean, it's, it's absolutely insane. And fentanyl is being found in basically everything today. It's being found in heroin and cocaine. There's pressed pills sometimes even gets into marijuana. It's just, it's truly the most dangerous time in history to be using any substance because of fentanyl. The school had implemented open houses like twice a week or whatever that parents could come in after hours and talk to the guidance counselors and stuff that, and every once in a while they would do a program of some sort. And I think that's, Stephen had come for one of those programs. So he ended up being a speaker at dinner, our dinner. second, um, our second dinner, yeah. dinner, fundraising dinner. We have a dinner every year. And he told. made such an impact on our town. The name of the organization is Maddie D's Rubber Ducky Organization. We felt we had to do something to help um, stop the madness and have other families not have to go through what we had gone through. Um, so the, the name came from the fact that my son collected rubber ducks. The aim of our organization is just to educate people about addictions and to destigmatize so that there can be conversations. You know, I set up the foundation because I, you know, to, to, to reach those middle school kids where the likelihood to try drugs would be at its peak. You know, listen, mental health is a really serious topic. I mean, we see it every day in the news. Focus on that mental health so that these kids don't succumb to the peer pressure of taking drugs. Um, and the motivation is Matthew behind the fund. It is to uh, do things in honor of his spirit and his love for people. We were fortunate to get the foundation up and running very quickly, but one of the things we wanted to do was also to come up with a, uh, a, a mission that was broad enough, clearly recovery, clearly addiction prevention, but also helping children. He kind of had two things going on. So he had a group of friends where they were smoking pot, um, but at the same time, he was uh, very active in the church, very active in, in his school plays, and, and really enjoyed working with other kids and helping them. He, he was a kid who looked for the child who was ignored. I think of Matthew in, I guess, probably four phases. One is as a young child. You know, he was a fabulous kid, loved life. Maddie was a handful from day one. Um, he, he Middle marched, child of five. Yes, middle child of five. He marched to the beat of his own drum, and um, but he was the light of the, the room. Like, he would light up a room. He was so much fun to be around. Everybody loved him. Oh man, oh man, my brother was an amazing guy. Uh, when he walked into a room, he had such a presence. He was so funny, so loud, had such a big personality. Um, when, you, when he came into a room, everybody knew it. Everything. Great athlete. Everything, great athlete. Tremendous athlete. I don't really know his drug story because I guess we lived in denial for a long time. Once he was out of school and he was never had any money, even though he was working, we kind of thought something was going up. But yeah, he came I, to us. I knew something was wrong. Yeah, he came. We to didn't us. really know how to treat it. Right. You know, we didn't know where to turn. Yeah. I mean, he was a baseball player ever since he was three years old, and now all of a sudden he didn't want to play anymore. Then he went to college to Penn State, and that really took him off the rails because he started doing drugs in a more serious way. I was approaching it from a very logical standpoint, and that's because I hadn't educated myself on what addiction is. I was just focused on his behaviors and really frustrated with the lying and the dichotomy in his personalities um, and not being able to trust him. <clears throat> but once I actually took the time to learn about what was happening, I much 
I had a much better understanding of why he was behaving the way he, want, he was. He didn't want to behave like that, um, but his brain was consumed. When he got home, it took him a year or so to decide he really wanted to get a college degree. And when he did that, he was at his best. We didn't find out until later that he had on his own gone to AA. We didn't realize that he was actually going through a problem, an issue with addiction. But I used to say to him, I said, Matt, this is gonna, this is gonna turn out two ways. Jail, or you're gonna die. But he would laugh it off, you know, nah, you know, I'm, not, I'm fine, this and I said, I'm telling you. I believe he started um, with weed, but then it got into much harder drugs in high school. And he mentioned it to my parents right away that he was scared that he was addicted. Um, and so right after high school, he went into um, a rehab and uh, he got hurt at work uh, plumbing. So he got prescribed Oxycontin, you know, became addicted to them pretty quickly. That, and I knew that he had fallen in a parking lot in, and hurt his back. And uh, he told us that at that point, the doctor prescribed um, the painkillers. It was a struggle. It was through the summer. He was caddying again, which was the way he really made money was caddying. He was a really good caddy. He was amazing up at, uh, I was going up to play golf uh, on a Sunday morning and um, he was going to be up there too. We, he was going to caddy for me. And we always, <clears throat> um, we always enjoyed that, that time together. And so it was like probably six o'clock in the morning I came down. I made coffee and then I was looking for Matthew. I couldn't find him. Um, and I opened up the back door just to see if he might be outside having a cigarette, which was another thing that I wanted him to stop. But, um, and there he was slumped at our table in the backyard. And, you know, 911, they came very quickly. They were very, they were great actually, uh, but it was, it was plainly too late. They couldn't get him, get him up. And then I had to, I'll go upstairs and get Marilyn because <clears throat> she was still sleeping and you know how do you tell your wife that one of her children has died in the backyard <clears throat> excuse me I, I would never want to see another family have to go through it's oh, it's heart-wrenching you know like we left him smiling and laughing hanging with his friends and six o'clock in the morning the next day, we get a phone call that he's gone. Yeah. You know, he's just gone. Yeah. At the time, my daughter said they took him to the hospital. They didn't, she didn't say whether he was alive or not. We drove all the way up in complete silence. And I kept thinking in my head, okay, maybe this is a good thing because now he can't deny it. He's got to go to rehab, you know, like, but as soon as we pulled into the parking lot of the hospital, there were a ton of kids out there already. And I said to my husband, he's dead. And I got out of the car and one of the friends came over and I said to him, don't you tell me. It's not coming from you. You know, cause I, and I walked inside and my daughter was there like in the arms of one of her friends, like unable to even talk. It turns out that my, daughter who was 20 at the time and Matthew's girlfriend found him. They tried to do CPR and everything and but he had been gone. He just yeah, he just he had aspirated and and at that time it had gone from you know the opioids to heroin because he couldn't um, you know obviously like it was just too expensive of a habit and he came back and he had done heroin again. And I said to him at that time, Albert, you had just gone away for three months. Like, what are you doing? And he said, I know, Michelle, I don't wish this feeling of wanting heroin on my worst enemy. I want to get better. Don't you think I want to be better? Got a phone call that very next morning um, on November 18th, 2010. And uh, they told him, your son is gone. And I wish there could be something that I could have said to him or done for him. But the lines went around the funeral parlor. It was over a thousand people. It was 
it was heartwarming and yeah. there were a million little rubber ducks with little messages written all over them and Don't think it can't happen Jeez. to your child. It can. It, <clears throat> it may, it can. Some of it may be um, what they're exposed to. Um, some of it may be that they're uh, predisposed to um, some sort of an addiction. I think, you know, I don't know that there's any really hard scientific evidence to it, but I think that there is at least anecdotal evidence that supports the view that some people can try something and move on and other people they try it once or twice and <clears throat> they're on. Uh, so I think there is something to, you know, it, it can happen, it can happen to anyone. On the upside, recovery is possible. We've met so many people that have been living clean, sober, wonderful lives that they never thought they would have. Um, but on the downside, nothing that you do is gonna make a difference. It's your loved one that has to want to make the difference. It's a lifelong struggle. Don't think it's gonna be taken care of by two weeks in a, in a detox facility or three months in a recovery facility or even six months in a sober living house. It's, it's something, it becomes a part of your life. There is no safe drugs. There is nothing out there anymore. No. Like, I mean, not that there ever was, but, you know, especially with now the fentanyl crisis and everything, you don't know what you're getting. Um, Stay, say no, that's you know, it. One, one, you, it sounds cliche, but one pill can kill. Yes. Uh, if you're a parent, get help. And by help, I mean, find somebody who is a drug counselor who can talk to you, not to your son or your daughter, but can talk to you. Helping people who are addicted and helping parents because you need a roadmap. Take the time, as Kristen said, to learn about addiction because that's the only way that you finally understand that at this stage, regardless of whether there was a choice when the drug was first taken, but at this stage, when their addiction, when the addiction has taken hold, it's no longer a choice. It is a disease. Don't hide it. Uh, hiding it, um, we, we, we didn't hide Matthew's addiction once we knew what it was about. We told people, we didn't you know, put it in the newspaper, but if somebody asked, I would tell them. And, and uh, there are several reasons for that. Number one, the stigma shouldn't be a stigma. And the more you treat it like a stigma, the more it is a stigma. I think the capacity for empathy and support is vastly underestimated. Everybody we told were empathetic and supportive, not judgmental. And, and the judgment and the stigma, if you haven't had it, if you haven't experienced it in your family, you're not immune. Just know that. You're not immune. Instead of judging and stigmatizing the people that are still struggling out on the streets, maybe give them a helping hand. Maybe go up and ask them what their story is. I'm not saying go out and give them money because I don't want to be responsible for giving someone money to, and it ends up taking their life. But let them know that you care. Don't shame them. We're already, I was already shamed. I was in shame. I could t tell you that this, like my family loved me and, and my brothers loved me, but they loved me from a distance. Like they was ashamed of the person who I was. Stigma is a big one. I always say it's the number one reason why I do this is trying to knock down some of the stigma attached to addiction. And it's such a hard thing to be able to overcome, but. The way I was able to overcome it is I stopped hiding from my past. This is who I am, this is what happened, and this is who I am today. If you want to just judge me from my past and not look at me at the person who I am today, then you're not somebody who I want in my life. My very best friend, we met the first day of kindergarten. Her name was Ashley, and uh, she was really struggling with a heroin addiction. And um, I was watching 
what she was going through. And, you know, she kept getting arrested for, for petty things. And meanwhile, I was watching the rest of my community really struggling, people I went to school with. Um, it's right, you know, 2015, when the opioid epidemic really started raging. And right about the time fentanyl started being introduced into things. And I thought, how do we have a city that's struggling and we have government that's not really talking about it, not enacting legislation, not really doing a lot to help. And so I talked to Ashley and I said, I think I might run for office. And she told me I was crazy. <laughs> but I said, well, listen, here's my philosophy. We need younger people in office, first of all. We need more diversity. And somebody's got to start doing something about this problem in our community. So in uh, January of 2016, I filed to run for the Hager Sound City Council. And I went out and I talked about opioids. That's all I talked about. You know, I started meeting with the health department, reading books, trying to really become a student of that environment. So thankfully in April of 2016, I won the primary. Then in June, unfortunately, Ashley had come to me. She'd just gotten out of jail. She was using again and she said, I really want to get help. Like, I'm, I really, I don't want to live like this anymore. And she stayed with me for a couple days and we tried over and over to find open beds and we couldn't find her treatment center. The first one available was six weeks out and she left my house and three weeks later, she overdosed and died. It has been my heart's work and my mission to help people because I couldn't save Ashley, but there are so many other Ashleys out there that can be saved. But um, I kind of took that and once I was able to grieve a little bit, I said, well, there's gotta be a reason for this. I told her I was gonna run for her, told her I was gonna be her voice. After that election, I decided to run for mayor and <laughs> Here I am, Mayor of Hager Sound. Today, a federal bankruptcy judge gave conditional approval to a multi-billion dollar plan to settle lawsuits against Purdue Pharma, the maker of OxyContin. That company is blamed for helping cause the opioid crisis. Tonight, its owners said they are sorry for the suffering and loss. Around 2010, uh, this is when the lawsuits started coming down for pharmaceutical companies like Purdue Pharma. They changed the chemical makeup of the 80 milligram OxyContin pills. They made it so you couldn't break it up anymore and snort it or shoot it. They made it like this gel form. And so then I switched to these uh, 30 milligram pills. Some people call them blues, Roxy's, Oxy's, things like that. And I was using 900 milligrams you a day. You have a drug, let's just say you have a drug like heroin, right? What drug cartels will do is they will take a different substance like fentanyl and they will add it in there. The reason they'll do that is because it makes it more potent. It makes it stronger. And fentanyl is so cheap for them to make that they can use this across all these different drugs and it makes them more money. But for anyone who uses it, you're at a much higher risk of overdose and potentially death. So that's what's going on today. And it's not just about even just lacing it. They've decided now to create their own prescription pills. So people think that they're buying prescription pills in the street. You think you're taking one thing, it could very easily be fentanyl today. Fentanyl crisis continuing to devastate families across America. And now it could be showing up in your kid's Halloween candy bag. Health officials are raising concerns about brightly colored fentanyl pills that are being found in packaging that looks like candy. You do not have to have a fear of going out on Halloween and getting fentanyl in your candy. That's not happening, okay? There's a lot of misinformation out there that is definitely not happening. Rainbow fentanyl is a thing, which means they are just taking these pills and putting them in different colors, but you don't have to worry about it like coming, showing up in like your candy or something like that, right? You think about it logically, how do drug cartels, how do they make money by just poisoning little kids with candy? They, they don't make any money like that, right? So what they're doing is, yes, it is a marketing strategy where they're trying to attract younger people, 
but you would have to go and buy drugs in order to get it. You know, I like to do research and there's uh, this thing called ISO. It's supposed to be 10 times more potent than fentanyl that's uh, coming out of D.C. and it's hitting the tri-state area. This drug is called ISO and health experts say it's up to 50 times stronger than fentanyl and often goes undetected during testing. ISO is linked to a growing number of overdose deaths across the country. It's believed to be so strong that it can kill someone just by being accidentally inhaled or by coming in contact with skin. This ISO emergence also comes as drug overdose incidents in general General, remain high nationwide. But now, heroin is not even the main issue anymore. It's fentanyl, which is 50 to 100 times more powerful than heroin. Including this now infamous photo of a man and woman in Ohio passed out in their car with the woman's four year old grandson in the backseat. Police suspect the heroin was laced with carfentanyl. Why would you, as a drug dealer, want to provide a substance that's going to kill your clients, right? I try and remove myself emotionally for a second and say, why would I do that? Why would I start selling a substance where people are dying? They're not buying from you anymore and it brings more heat, more attention. And what he said was it's so much cheaper for them to make fentanyl and it's so much more potent that the cost justifies itself. And basically they just write off people's lives as a business expense. With the amount that I was using, it would have just been a matter of time before I got my hands on a pill that turned out to be fentanyl and, and I'd be gone. Local outpatient clinics, social agencies, the church, all are needed if drug addicts are to adjust to a new life. Without intensive effort by all community forces, very few drug addicts can ever expect to return to a normal, useful life in society. Through police intervention, I got into rehab. And I went, I was fortunate enough to go back to the rehab that I had went to in the first place. They have this thing, what they call the clean time countdown. When you have your clean time, they, they'll scream out the, um, a year or day or whatever. And I had watched the people before me jump up to celebrate their clean time. And it was groups of people. It was five people, 10 people, seven people, three people. And when it was, when they said 60, 59, I jumped up and I looked around and it was just me. I had never felt so alone in a room full of people until that moment. And in my mind, I said to myself, like, I will never have 59 days again because I will never, I never want to feel this feeling. Um, am I tempted? At times I am, but do I act on it? No, because I know where it will lead me. I really live a real good life, man. I, I, I've, I've come from being a crackhead. I work for New York State. I work for the federal government, and now I have a career where I work for a, a Fortune 500 company. And like, who did who? A crackhead like me. My life is far beyond my wildest dreams. I would have never imagined that I would be where I am today from where I came from. I love you very much. At first, I didn't understand what you were going through, but now I do and you made it and you have a great testimony that you can help someone which you do help someone take everything i don't want it i don't need it god because god is in your life this is already your purpose so the walk that you are walking God is walking with you and you will continue to do the work of God by healing and speaking to people that's been through what you've been through. Ever since I was little, young, young, young buck, you've been holding me down. And I saw everything you went through. <laughs> saw everything you've been through, you know what I'm saying? I saw the ups and the downs. 
and now you're back up. And that's what's up. And you've always been here for me, and I'm here for you. And you never let us down. No matter what time of day we call you, you're always there. That's we it. love you. Yeah. I have a job that I help people like myself. Two of them, actually. Um, you know, I have a house. It's not the best house, but it's my house. I have a car. It's not the best car, but it's my car. Um, I am free. I don't have to use. I, I don't. I, I make a choice today to do the right thing, and I don't always know what the right thing is, but I do know what wrong is, and I know that if I don't do what's wrong, that I gotta end up doing something right. I once spoke at a high school in Long Island. And after I spoke, this teacher, it was actually a no, principal, came up to me and said, you found a way to take your mess and you turned it into a message. And that resonated with me so much because for the longest time, I viewed my addiction and everything I went through as strictly a negative experience. But whether it's addiction, whether it's mental health, whether it's both, whether it's trauma or whatever struggle you have in your life, it's not about the struggle, it's how you can learn from it, you can grow from it, and, and use it to help other people. There are so many great opportunities out there for all of you. So many ways for you to live your life without the use of drugs and alcohol. I do it every single day. I actually found a way to take all my pain, all my struggle, and I figured out what I really want to do with my life. I found what my passion is, and it's doing this right here. He is the best father. Um, we have a six month old and he's with her right now. And, um, knowing what he was, or what, not what he was, what he was doing, you know, in high school to where he is now, it just makes me love him even more. For the longest time, I had convinced myself that recovery, a meaningful, a healthy life, was just not possible for someone like me. I convinced myself I was a failure and now was given this real second chance. We talked for a little while, we joked around. Before I walked out, the program director gave me a big hug and he said to me, you might have one more high left in you, but I seriously doubt you have one more recovery. Take this gift that you've been given and go do something extraordinary. Go use it to help a lot of people. And I haven't looked back ever since. And now today, one day at a time, I started to build a life for myself that's worth staying sober for. That's a big part of my message too, is that I didn't get sober to be miserable. I, I had to believe that I could build this life for myself that's worth staying sober for, that's worth living. I thought to myself, I can either hide from this for the rest of my life, or I can just put it all out there. Put it all out there, you can't use it against me. And so I put it all out there, it's worked in my favor, and it's, I'm at peace, I'm free from it. Look, look.